thank you also for the invitation to Christina, mainly the main, and uh, it's okay, it's working. So it's a pleasure to be here. We have an um, international audience, it's a little nervous, man. So I'm a physicist, I'm a, uh, you do uh, something more about physics, not about chemistry and biology. But I think it's very important because I work a lot of biologists, a lot of chemistry. And then I think that is biophotonics area, I think is very interesting area because you are so interdisciplinary and you need that to do a good job. But before we start, I will uh, talk about a little from my department. I'm from a physics department from the Factory of Philosophy of Science and Letters of, at Ribeirão Preto City is a campus from University of Sao Paulo, and we are only on hour from Sao Carlos with a car. So the main areas that we are doing in our department are for physics applied to healthcare, and my job is optics. Optics are in diagnosis and dosimetry and a general spectroscopy work. And you have another areas here. And before we start into talking about light dosimetry, I select two slides to show what I do and diagnose. So this is the first, summarize the first, the first work, that we employ time result fluorescence. In this work, we elect that the fluorescence lifetime excited at 300 nanometer in a thyroid tissue, you can detect difference between malignant and health, malignant and, and benignal tissue and using the lifetime when the emission, uh, at emission 340 nanometers, okay? That is the main result that you have in one research, in one collaboration with our hospital. A second work that summarizes our work in uh, infrared spectroscopy, that you have some images. We have some hyperspectral image here. Hyperspectral image is each pixel you have not only the RGB color but you have a spectrum, and we use this spectral cluster, similar uh, the, 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 the pixels, and so you can assign some 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 assignment. Here we see the assignment from from, from our pathologist to creep to more severe inflammation, inflammation, and uh, we use this to train a set of sample. We train an algorithm, and then we employ linear discriminant analysis to uh, predict tissue, tumor tissue, or inflammation tissue. With this result, with this set of samples, about 70 samples, and uh, we observe some accuracy of 60% 60 per, 60 near. So we return to our subject. I elect, like Dosimitri to speak here, because this is a lecture, but we are in a biophotonics school. I think it's important to take talking about some more basic, some more important, some more broad to be useful for everyone. Né? And uh, the first that you, you be highlight is the importance of light dosimetry. What is important for light dosimetry? I, in my PhD work, and uh, I learned very fast that uh, uh, high power lasers is very problematic when you don't do a good dosimetry because you change so fast between the effects, né? then it's important to do a good dosimetry. And the, 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 the one important, the second, is you can increase and uh, like matter interaction. Eh? You can increase your knowledge about like matter interaction. And so you can predict better results, better results in chemistry, in biology, in medicine. And another big important is you have some standard. When you make a dosimetry, you have a standard. You know when you expose your results, you must expose your dosimetry together because when another, perp another research you want to reproduce, you must use this dosimetry to reproduce well. If you resume what you can measure in light dosimetry, you have another, a lot of quantities in physics. physics. You can about radiometry, about dosimetry. First, when we are talking about radiometry, we are talking about only about the source. We are talking about dosimetry, we are talking about the interaction of the source with your sample, with your target. I, uh, the, the best physical quantity is this one, is the, how much photons per square meter, per second, per nanometer, per stellar radian you are measuring. So if you are in the skin, in your skin, in the sun, you are burning, so you can measure how much photons your, the sun are interacting with you per square meter of skin, per second, per nanometer, because you have a broadband uh, source, 
and perstereagen is the angle solid, solid angle. Or if you are in a dense, you are employing blue lead to photocurium. This quantity is the photon spectral radian. Sometimes it is too much quantities to measure. Né? I'm not interested in the angle, solid angle, not interested in the star radian. So you can remove this and you can measure the photo spectral irradiance. If you're not interested in the number of photons, you can measure the radiance. So on. Then you have a spectrum in red, the spectrum of the sun, and that is a spectral irradiance. It's a typical measurement that you can do in biophotonics. Or if you are not interested in the area that you are irradiating, eh? you are interested only in the power, you can also measure the spectral power. That means that how much power you are radiating over a spectral range without considering the irradiated area. Okay? If you integrate, integrate the spectral radiance, you access the radiance. If, if you integrate the spectral power, you access the power, of course. So I start the light dosimetry. It's important to know that I say light, but light is only the optical radiation assigned to the, what is visible to your eyes. The correct name is optical dosimetry, okay? Because you can introduce optical radiation from ultraviolet or infrared. That is the, I name it level zero. It's the first step in your laboratory when you do a dosimetry. You have your radiance, you have your power, you have your error, and you can, cal can calculate your fluence without spectral information. The joke in my laboratory, I said it is a kindergarten dosimetry. It's everything correct, but it's when you start to do your dosimetry, okay? With this, we can measure your fluence, okay? I say fluence, not dose, not like dose, okay? Fluence is correct, more correct. If you go to another level, if you want to choose some information, spectral information, you can introduce a, a, a measurement that they say, a dosimetry that they name it spectral dosimetry. So you use your spectral radiance, you use your spectral power, and what you can do is not only to the total is, uh, spectral radius of the sun. If you are conducting an uh, experiment with BTU blue, for example, in the, in, the, in the sun, you cannot integrate all the spectral radius and measure and give these radius as the correct radius that you are interacting with your photosynthesizers. You must collect only to the spectral range where the uh, BTU blue is absorbing. Then one possibility is to integrate only a spectral range and then use these irradiance to calculate your fluence. This is the first step. I name it level one. We can do a second level, level two. That I interact and in I measure the, the effective irradiance in another way. You are looking, not integrating the spectral range where you're observing because your source is a LED, for example. You must to multiply the spectral radius of your LED and the absorbance of your photosensitizers, multiplying and integrating this value can measure, you can better measure the, how much irradiance, how much photons are interact with your photosensitizers. An example is here to have a, 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 a four different photosensitizers. You have one wavelength, one LED system with a peak in 636. You have a, some band, if you multiply and you have uh, effective spectral irradiance, integrating this, you have some measurement. You have how much milliwatts per square centimeter you are interacting with your photosensitizer. So you can compare, okay. Uh, the, the, the main problem is that it's only you are comparing the interaction of your light with your phot photosensitizer. You are not saying nothing about how this photosensitizer will produce some uh, effect. Another similar approach is the, if you take into account only the absorbed irradiance. Imagine that you have some irradiance zero in the top of your sample. After that, you have some transmitted irradiance. What stays inside is the absorbed irradiance. If you take this absorbing irradiance ration of the incident ra irradiance, you can ponder, you can weight your spectral irradiance by a factor, and this factor is almost the, is an absorbance, because, but, but in this case, the, the factor varies from zero to one. It's some kind of a different approach than before. And with this, you can measure also the uh, absorbed irradiance. It's a reference here, we use this approach. But to increase a little more information about your 
photosensitizer, you if you have your molar absorptivity, then you can employ not more the absorbers, but you can employ the correct values. What is the, what molar absorptivity measure? You measure how much square meter of cross section your sample produce per mole of molecules. If you use this instead, the absorbance, you see that your absorbed irradiance is not more per square meter or something like that. It's how much watts per mole you are putting on your sample. That is more interesting to measure. If you do that, you can compare, for example, two layout systems. One is 633, and another 658. is a very typical layout system that you use in photodynamic therapy. But you have some similar peaks. If you integrate these values, you have some different value also, see? If you conduct, if you are, in, you are interested in measure how these different sources interact with your material blue, you can measure how much mole, uh, watts per mole per nanometer you are putting in each, in, in each case. Integrating, you see some bigger differences in how much watts per mole you are putting on your sample. Okay, up now we are considering constant irradiance, constant molar absorptivity, constant absorbance. If you are not considering a constant, if, you're, if your source is the sun and you experiment along the day, you know that the irradiance of the sun is zero in the morning, go to the maximum value in midday, and go down again. So you must consider a time dependence of this radiance. Here express it that your spectral radiance is not, much, not more wavelength dependent, it's also time dependent. So the, the main problem is that you cannot consider more the radiance times irradiation time. You must consider an integration over the time because the radiance are changed along the day. That is one example. The second example is the photobleaching, of course. Your molar absorptivity is not more wavelength dependent. You have some factor that reduce your absorption. And then you must ponder this and measure also over the time if your radiance absorbed irradiance are different. I'm sorry, here the, what is different is the molar absorptivity. This value decreases over the time. So, what is the next? Here, the next. The next is some kind different. If you don't know what happens with your sample, you don't know the optical props of your sample, you are doing the experiment in vivo, what, what can you do if you don't know nothing about your optical properties? You can look only to the biological effect. You know that if you are interacting with different wavelengths, you have some different response, of course. Understand? That the, 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 the correlation is very correlated with the, the absorption spectrum because the absorption spectrum would give an effect. But you don't know nothing about that. So it's possible to to do some experiments and to measure the action aspect. And the biological action aspect, that is the name of this um, biological dependent dosimetry, use this spectra to measure how effective a source is to produce this effect. Uh, the best, we have examples to damage in DNA. We have the action spectra to damage in DNA, to retain formation, to the eye sensitive, or damage induced by photodynamic therapy. The more typical, the more common, action spectrum is the action spectrum who forms erythema. When you go to the, the sun, your skin becomes burned, that is erythema, and this activity, this, this erythema is, is uh, wavelength dependent. You have more effects in erythema for deep ultraviolet in, your, in these wavelengths, and you have a lower action value for the erythema in the wavelength 400, for example, okay? So the question is how, if you have the sun, or you have a sun in the morning at eight, you have some different spectra of the source, how this different source can produce erythema? What you can do that is only multiplying this irradiation, irradiation um, spectral radiance times the actual spectra, and then can wait how is your source active to do erythema. To better understand, the UV index is this measurement. The UV index that you see in the newspapers is only integration of a spectral range of the sun in different uh, uh, times uh, from the uh, uh, action spectrum of erythema, and then you can measure this value over the day. Here we have an example to better understand. 
understand this, uh, the, what is the meaning of biological action spec. If you produce some damage in photodynamic therapy, you know that if you change a, a, uh, your wavelength, you can be a different effect. So here, this reference, measure the tissue damage if you change your wavelength over a small range of wavelength. You see here, at 650, you have a higher tissue damage, and 10 nanometers a, 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 a increase or decrease value, 10 nanometers, you have a lower action, lower effect. Another possibility of an example is when you are considered um, absorbers and scatters. Imagine that you have absorption coefficients and scatter coefficients. Here, you are considering that your sample has turbidity. Before, when we are employed the molar absorptivity, we are not considering turbidity. Imagine that your sample, the example here is a, a dental composite. Sorry. I'm a little nervous, eh? to speak to international audience here. And uh, we actually, uh, what we have here is a dental composite, and we measure at uh, the scattering coefficients in red and the black, the absorption coefficient, and calculate the effective attenuation coefficient. Imagine that you have this. If you can, with this, you can, you can then calculate how deep are you going your, your, your radiation over the spectral range. Imagine that dental composite is a mix of uh, silica, polymers, and photoinitiators. The photoinitiators, in this case, are come for quinone. You have absorption peak in 460 nanometers. Is a like, like difference when is the sample, is the, when the dental composite is cured or not cured. And the scattering coefficient don't change so much. If you have this attenuation coefficient, you understand that the irradiation, the spectral radiance at the top of your target dental composite is one value. One millimeter beneath here, you have another value. And here you have a decrease near 50%. So you have the spectral radiance at the bottom of one millimeter, at the bottom of your sample. The question is, if you must to irradiate the comforquinone to polymerize this polymer, you must measure how much spectral radiance you have at the lower bo bottom of your sample. So you can take this one millimeter minute spectral radiance here, the red curve, and use to the photo, the comforquinone molar absorptivity, and to measure how much mo watts per mole you are putting on your sample one millimeter beneath the surface. Here we can observe that if you have the spectral information, if you integrate this value, you have at the top eight uh, ten, times ten to, uh, thousand watts per mole, and here you have 50% lower value. So you can measure the difference and you can improve your system, your experiment. At the last level, I safe to do a dosimetry, is the Monte Carlo simulation. I don't do that my, at my laboratory. That is a courtesy of uh, Teresa here from the Institute. I don't know where is Teresa here. Ah, here. <laughs> Thank you for the picture. And I, I, I simulate here what you have if you, if you want to introduce in your experiment the geometrical informations. Here we have a, a sample of 14 to 30 millimeters. You have a beam of five millimeters. And I give to Teresa the optical properties and, and, this, and the absorption coefficient and the scatter coefficient. And she produced a three-dimensional uh, distribution of light in the tissue. So with this dimensional, you can measure in different places your spectral radiance, and with this information, you can produce a better dosimetry in different layers of your sample. That is the, the idea of Monte Carlo simulation to predict the, the radiance. Up now, I show examples of what is important to do when you, when you want interest to make some dosimetry from your system. To access this dosimetry, you must to have information from your source and information from your sample. Here is the, 
what you need to do this dosimetry. You need to inspect your agents, and you need the spectral power, and of course you need the error, the radiated error. And from the target, if you don't know nothing about your sample, you can do the action spectrum. You can measure the action, you can produce your action spectrum, and you can predict how different sources can produce different biological response. If you know something about your sample, and your sample are not as uh, high, uh, don't have high scattering, eh? not turbidity, you can, pre uh, can use molar absorptivity in the in laboratory. If you want, if you if your sample is a biological tissue, you have a high scatter. So you must measure the absorption coefficient, the scattering coefficient, and maybe calculate the effective attenuation coefficient. For the source, maybe easy, but you must to have calibrated lamps, spectrometers, calibrated spectrometers. You must guarantee some stability between uh, and some thermal stability and some correspondence between the calibration process and the experiment. There is no meaning to calibrate in your laboratory with some conditions, and you measure outside in the sun, burning your spectrometer at 45 to 60 degrees. And after that, when you calibrate your system, you must avoid a lot of things, like optical dam damage or optical misalignment. To exemplify, we have the, to access the spectral rate of the sun over the time. The first problem is to access the roof. Né? You have a control passport in my laboratory here. And then you must do, after that, you can pass this control passport, and then you have access to the roof. You can construct your system, put the appropriate optical entrance, put the appropriate spectrometer, put the spectrometer in a thermal box, control, stabilize your temperature, that, so you can calibrate your system. After calibrating, what is the calibration? Here is a picture from the calibration. You are measuring the spectral responsivity, his, who measures the electro output from an op optical input. Eh? That is a spectral responsivity, and here is the, the meaning of this uh, quantity, and what you want is a stable value of spectral dosimetry, and you don't <laughs> want a noise, because a noise means that you are a noise in your measurement. Of course, you need your beam profile, this is the easy part, and about the samples, if you don't know nothing about your sample, but you are interested in how the, way the radiation interacts with your sample, you can conduct the, the following experiment. That is not my result. It's a simulated result that I take from this reference here. If you have different wavelengths, you can irradiate your sample with different wavelengths, and you can measure the biological response over different values of fluence then you have some kind of a sigmoid curve. You have no response here, you have increased value in a saturation response here. If you see, you have different curves or different wavelengths, and this, for example, you have a, it's easy to produce an effect if your radiation is in 550, in a green wavelength. It's more hard to produce the same effect for blue or red. With this, you construct an action spectrum, okay? Here are two approaches from the action spectrum, then you are measuring how difficult, how easy it is to produce your, your, uh, uh, this effect. If your sample is uh, low turbidity, you can measure molar absorptivity, then you have access to your photosensitizer or your different uh, sample, your interest. But the problem is here, you are measuring only the transmitted power. Yeah? That is valid only if you have no turbidity. If you have turbidity, you must to make a different approach, and you must to measure the diffuse transmitted and the diffuse reflectance value. And also, you must to calculate some loss that you have from your sample. And for this approach, what you need is calibrated phantoms, and integrated spheres. Calibrated phantoms, we are polyurethane, ink, and titanium dioxide, who are some difference because if you are more interested in, in uh, high scattering values or low scattering values, you must have phantoms for different uh, situations. And uh, what we want with this experiment is to access the absorption coefficient, the scattering coefficient, and calculate the effective attenuation coefficient. And with this, we can measure the radiation uh, uh, spectral radiance at different layers from your sample. 
when you buy this phantom, you are not buying their polar return piece. Né? You are buying calibrated values for scattering coefficient, absorption coefficient, some optical properties also, and you use this information to calibrate your system. After that, you can measure your own samples. Here are the diagram. You, can, uh, you have your sample here. You are measuring the transmittance, diffuse transmittance, reflectance, diffuse uh, reflectance, some reference, and here the collimated transmittance. That is the, our system at Ribeirão Preto that we have in our laboratory. And how we access this information is the reflectance, transmittance, diffuse values, and the collimate transmittance as an input from an algorithm an inverse adding doping, and this algorithm, I don't you go over more informations, but we have the output, the absorption coefficient and the scatter coefficient, and also the anisotropy factor. Here are the reference in a nice website. We have a lot of information about this algorithm. At the moment, we have a calibrated phantom from Professor Scott, Scott Prow, and we are denominated now values, and here our measurements. We have some correspondence who measured with our systems. This we have for we a measurement for only one, only one um, wavelength. Another approach is to do the same, but with a homemade system. We print this at home, and we cover the inside of the spheres with uh, sulfate, bio sulfate. And we employ not uh, wavelengths, only a laser wavelength, but we employ spectro uh, spectrometers and broadband sources. With this system, we can measure the same than before, but with a little more error because we are putting so much light inside, and the detectors are more sensitive to thermal noise. But we can access a broad range of informations. Here we have the reflectance in red, the transmittance, and give this as input for the algorithm, inverse adding Dolby algorithm, and we measure the absorption, the scattering coefficients, and the absorption coefficients, and this is the results from this phantom, that we name it clear phantom, low turbidity. So, that is our group, small group. Professor George is here with us. And here are the students who are attending this school. And, and uh, we have also Professor Amando from uh, Specialist in Fluorescence and Professor Yuri, Yuri Borisevic, Specialist in Photodynamic Therapy. I will thank our agents, financial support, and if you are interested to contact me, please use this email. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you so much for the great talk. Thank um, you. I'm just wondering, I probably missed I'm sorry? it. So, in a case um, when you don't know the optical properties, you measure the biological response spectrum. Yes. So, I'm just wondering how do you calibrate the spectrum so you can compare between different tissues? How do you calibrate? Yes, how do you calibrate? Yeah, you're talking about this. Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, on the roof, né? I show the, this one. Uh, in a case when you don't know the optical properties. Ah, uh, yes, that, the, yeah. This one? Yeah. Now, this is a simulated value. Oh. The, 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 the biological response here, this is a simulated value. This is only a, a, a result that is not, not real. It's only to show and uh, what, you are, what you can measure here, if you, I don't have results to that because I don't have results in my laboratory, né? but what you are measuring here, you can measure how much cells you are killing, how much damage you are producing in your tissue. And these results increase for different values of fluence. And normally, you have no damage in the beginning of fluence, a very small fluence. When you increase your fluence, you produce the damage, and after that, you don't produce more damage then have some kind of a sigmoid prof profile. And here, to produce an, an, an actual spectra, you are measuring, for example, uh, 
how much effect, if you combine this line here, how much effect you produce for different wavelengths, for a constant fluence. You see that for the green line, you have a higher value. And for the red, intermediated. And for the blue line, you have a, a lower effect. And with this, you can produce this curve here, that is the biological action spectrum. I can send you some more uh, real data from another groups. Thank you. More questions? No. Thank, Thank you, you Professor. <laughs>